I have rarely been accused of being a helicopter mom. I'm more of a natural consequences girl, the kind that makes other moms just a little nervous at the park. But nothing brings on the hovering and even swooping like a kid with a pocket full of money. For one thing, when my kids have money, it almost immediately converts to Legos. I actually love Legos, but we are drowning in them. And they're so expensive on a kid's budget. And then there's the dreaded toy aisles, watching the kids waffle between one toy or another. And let's face it, kids make some pretty bad decisions about how to spend money. Of course, this is the whole point, letting them make some bad decisions and experience buyer's remorse so they learn to make better choices the next time. So I resist helicoptering because it's better for them to learn this lesson with Washington's now than with Benjamin's later on. This is the How She Moms podcast, where we talk about how different moms solve the same problems. I'm Whitney Archibald, a mom of five kids myself. I collect ideas so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. In this episode, we're going to talk about how different moms teach their kids about money. We'll talk about how their kids come by that money in the first place, whether by allowance, jobs around the house, or jobs for other people, how moms manage their family economic systems, and how to teach kids good spending, saving, and giving habits. So I always like to approach each topic by talking about strategy first. And this is where the fun begins on the topic of money. Get a bunch of moms in the same room, and this is a good way to stir up some controversy. The main argument here is whether you pay your kids for doing chores, a commission-based system, or whether you have a set weekly or monthly allowance. Of course, there are also two other options, a pay-as-you-go system where kids ask for money when they need or want it, and you decide to give it to them or not. Or, of course, there's the option of not giving them any money at all. I'm not going to go into great detail about the pros and cons of each of these systems here because it's actually a giant can of worms. If you want more details about the specific philosophies, I wrote a whole article about it on my blog entitled The Great Allowance Debate. So you can check it out there. I'll link to it in my show notes. But I'll also give the basic arguments here. Moms who use an allowance-based system generally believe that the purpose of giving kids money is for them to learn to use it. This should be independent of helping out around the house because children need to learn that doing chores and cleaning up after themselves is just part of being in a family. They won't get paid for doing these things in their adult life. They shouldn't get paid now. The purpose of giving kids money is to teach them how to use it wisely. The chore system is a separate entity with the purpose of teaching them to work. And then you have the other side of the argument, the moms that use a commission-based system. They believe that paying kids to do chores teaches them the real-world concept that when you work, you get money. When you don't, you don't. Giving kids money without having to work for it gives kids a sense of entitlement. Of course, many families do a hybrid of these two systems where some chores have a payment attached and others don't. There's always infinite variety in the system you choose for your family. And then there's the argument for not giving kids money at all. We already provide food, shelter, and basic needs. Giving money on top of that just encourages entitlement and consumerism. And sometimes there's another even more practical argument if you just don't have the money to spare. I have swung back and forth between allowance and commission with my family. When we first started giving our kids money, we gave it on commission. They did chores, we paid in cash. We'd all keep up with chore charts for a while, paying an agreed upon amount for what they did. Then when each chore chart eventually fizzled, we'd come up with a new one. Then I decided to switch to an allowance-based system. I thought it sounded like a pretty good idea, partly because it was so much easier to administer. We paid each kid their age in dollars each month, instead of having to keep track of all the chores that they did. I also liked the idea of teaching them how to manage money and to teach them that chores were just expected as part of the family. A year into this system, however, I realized that I was paying my kids and they were barely lifting a finger to help in the house. Their rooms were spewing clothes and books into the hallways. They left their dishes on the table. And I won't even talk about the boys' bathroom. I have four sons, enough said. So now we've moved on to a lazy mom's commission system. That means we don't use charts, which I love to make and hate to implement. They don't get paid for cleaning their rooms and bathrooms, practicing piano, doing their homework, cleaning up after themselves, or doing their kitchen jobs. They just don't get to play or have screen time until these are done. 
but they can earn money for doing extra chores, such as cleaning out or vacuuming the car, taking out the trash, babysitting, vacuuming, etc. Of course, the strategy you choose depends on your objectives. What do you want to teach your kids? Are you trying to teach them that work equals money? Do you want them to learn to budget, to save, or to spend wisely? Do you want to teach them to give generously? Or do you just want to have them stop asking you for money and stuff all the time? Once you figure out what you want to accomplish and pick your strategy, there are so many ways to go about setting up your family economy. First, you have to figure out when to start. I received mixed responses on this. Most moms I talked to started paying their kids when they started school. Others wait until they're eight and more responsible. Some vary the age based on the personalities of their kids and whether they can keep from losing money. And a few cut off allowances at 12 when the kids could start earning money by babysitting, mowing lawns, or other things for other people. And then there's the question of how much to pay. A big part of this decision depends on what you expect your kids to pay for. Most moms I talked to expect children to pay for any toys or activities outside of birthday or holiday gifts or family activities and for extra fun clothing items. Some also have kids pay for gifts for friends or siblings. Those who pay a more generous allowance often require kids to pay for clothing and other needs as well, though this is usually once they get closer to the teenage years. Many parents also are willing to meet kids halfway on large purchases, such as summer camps, bicycles, etc. So how much are moms actually paying these days? A lot of them tie it to age. So for example, they'll get $1 more than their age each month, or a dollar per grade each week. Some get double their grade each month, and others just do a set dollar amount, like they start at $3 and they go up to $8, depending on the age of their kids. Some get a dollar per chore, or a dollar per day for days that they complete their chores, and others just have set amounts for different chores. In Sarah's house, teaching her kids financial responsibility is serious business. She starts her kids off with a lump sum of $50 at age 9, and then they can earn up to $40 a week if they can get all their chores done. This may sound like a lot of money, but the kids buy all of their own clothes, ski gear and passes, they pay for their summer camps, and, other thi and any other extra things like toys, treats, or movie tickets. Really, all Sarah and her husband pay for is socks and underwear, family activities, sports and music lessons, school supplies, food, haircuts, and toiletries. I'll link to an article on my blog where she talks about her whole system in detail. It's pretty fascinating. So most families choose a consistent time, either weekly or monthly, for payday. Financial expert Susie Orman suggests paying weekly for young kids and then every other week by age 12, kind of like a paycheck. The big variations come in how families distribute the money, from cash to fake checking accounts to phone apps. Here are some examples. Heidi's Family Bank is a binder with nine pencil pouches, three for each kid. One pouch is for spending, one pouch is for saving, and one is for giving. Each pouch has a ledger inside as well. When money goes in or goes out, the kids mark on the ledger how much was added or taken out and the purpose for it. When they make money, they automatically give 10% to the giving pouch, and then they divide the rest into saving and spending. To encourage long-term saving, Heidi offers a monthly 8% interest rate. Ralphie has had enough experience with kids losing money that she decided to have a virtual checking account for her kids instead. They use check registers to keep track of deposits and withdrawals, and they write fake checks to their mom if they want something at the store. Ralphie then pays for the item with her credit card. Each of Audra's kids keep cash in three jars, one for spending, one for saving, and one for giving. I use the Bankaroo app to track my kids' money virtually. There are a lot of apps out there that do this, um, Allowance Bot, Allowance Manager, FamZoo, but we've settled on Bankaroo. Each of my children have two accounts, one for spending and one for giving. The app allows us to track what they earn and spend, and since I always have my phone with me when we're shopping, they don't have to remember to bring their money. I just always know how much money they have. This is just virtual money, of course. I use my own credit card to pay for things. I just deduct it from their account. It's really like a ledger on an app. Each, each of my children also has a real savings account for long-term savings. 
and then we match their contributions for their savings accounts. Shanine tracks her kids' money on an Excel spreadsheet and tracks their savings accounts with them online. Okay, now let's talk about how kids earn money. Kids and moms alike can get pretty creative about great ways for kids to earn money in and out of the home. Lisa has chore auctions on Saturdays so the kids can bid on how much money they are willing to accept to do specific chores. Genius. Heidi's kids n live near a golf course and they started a business selling golf balls and water to passing golfers. They run the whole business and she does very little behind the scenes. Sometimes her 11-year-old brings home $50 on a Saturday afternoon. While $20 used to be a nebulous amount of money to her kids, they now equate it to a certain number of hours spent selling golf balls. Jessica provides opportunities for her older kids to work at their family-owned business. Since it's a little more difficult for the younger kids to work, she pays them for reading books. To pay her kids for doing extra chores, Lori sometimes clips dollar bills directly onto her job board, labeled with specific jobs, different amounts depending on the jobs. It's a very tangible way to show them how much money they stand to make. Other weeks, she'll just write jobs and dollar amounts for the kids to pick from a jar. Once the kids have money, we have to teach them how to use it. Lisa's a big proponent on letting them make mistakes and learning from them. She lets her kids spend their money on whatever they want, even if it seems like a really bad idea. They just have one rule. You can spend your allowance however you like, as long as it doesn't cause a problem. Of course she's had times when a child has bought something of low quality that she knew would break, but she didn't say anything. And when it inevitably does break, she doesn't say, oh, I knew that would happen. She's just sympathetic and kind and tells the kids, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. The child learns the lesson from the consequences far more powerfully than they would by their mom predicting the consequences. Mary Price's daughter saved up and bought a $200 iPod Touch. Soon after buying it, she lost it on an airplane. She was devastated. They submitted a report and waited and prayed, but no one ever found it. Mary obviously felt bad about this, and she could have easily purchased a new one for her, but she decided to have her daughter save up again for a new one. When that daughter finally did save enough money, she actually ended up buying something different. Several moms I talked to implement a think-it-through period to help avoid impulse buys, usually a day or two. In his book, The Opposite of Spoiled, Ron Lieber talks about a family who made their kids write essays explaining why they wanted to buy big-ticket items, just to make sure they really thought it through first. Heidi doesn't usually let her kids buy anything at the store unless they go there specifically to purchase that item. For example, she won't say yes to candy in the checkout aisle, even if they have the money to spend, unless they have come to the store specifically to buy candy. When my son saved money to buy an especially expensive Lego set, my husband and I helped him come up with a list of other things that he could buy with the same amount of money. Then we let him make the choice. He ultimately decided to use the money to pay for a plane ticket to fly his cousin in for a visit. We did subsidize this one a little bit with our miles. Really, every time we take our kids to the store, it can be a teaching opportunity. Heidi talks to her children a lot about opportunity cost and helps them compare prices. A movie theater is a great place to demonstrate this concept. Heidi has her kids look at the price of candy or treats and evaluate whether it's a good deal compared to what it costs elsewhere. One of Heidi's proudest moments was when they went to an amusement park and saw a stuffed animal for $20. One of her kids said to his brother, that toy costs as much as 20 ice cream cones. Ron Lieber, author of The Opposite of Spoiled, came up with a great system to teach kids about the relative costs of different brands. He draws a horizontal line with the word need on one side and want on the other. On the need side, he writes the cost of a discount brand of a specific item, and on the far right, he writes the price of the most expensive name brand. Then he, he makes a vertical line in the middle, which they call the land's end line. This is his definition of a suitably mid-priced merchant that sells quality clothing. So they research how much that item would cost at Land's End, and that's how much they're willing to pay. If, if his daughter wants to go over the Land's End line and buy something more expensive, she has to pay the difference with her own money. Mary teaches her kids not to buy anything unless they really love it. 
they never buy things just because they're on sale because once they once that item enters their home they then have to manage it they have to wash it fold it keep track of it etc so as a family they're very careful about the items they allow into their home another way to teach kids to spend wisely is to model the behavior ourselves by making our own decision making process visible for example, when Amanda makes a grocery list, she talks to her kids about how having a list helps her avoid, avoid impulse buying. She also explains that they can't buy a new car because they're a single income family and the old car works fine. Before she buys something, she asks herself out loud, do I really need this or would my money be better spent somewhere else? Heidi also thinks it's important to take her kids shopping with her, especially for essentials like groceries or clothes. Then they know these things don't magically appear, and they can see her comparing prices. Shanine has been amazed at how different it is to teach different children about money. All of her six children handle money differently. Just among her three oldest kids, she has one that's a saver, one that's a spender, and one that's kind of in between those two. Each of these spending personalities comes with its own weaknesses and strengths. So she has to use different teaching techniques with each of these kids, of course. Above all, she makes sure they understand that money was meant to make us and others happy and that when used wisely, it can bring blessings. Teaching kids how to spend money is one thing. Teaching them to save it is quite another. Most parents either strongly encourage or even require their children to save some of the money they receive. This usually starts with short-term savings, such as toys or activities, and then builds up to long-term savings for things like cars and college. Lieber had a great suggestion that to teach young children to save, you can even cut out a picture of a toy that they want to save up for and tape it to his or her savings jar as a tangible reminder of what they're working toward. Many parents encourage their kids to save by teaching them about the principle of interest. Some offer a monthly interest rate of anywhere from 5% to 50% of whatever they put in their savings account. Jessica even matches savings contributions to her children's college and mission fund dollar for dollar. Her such a good return makes her kids eager, eager to save. If her children decide to take their savings and use it for something besides college or a mission, Jessica takes her match back. Audra had a big discussion with her children about saving and the time value of money, and they opened up an investment account for their teenager. He has really enjoyed tracking and evaluating his investments. The big whammy of savings goals for most children is college. Susie Orman suggests having a conversation about the cost of college early at around ninth grade. She recommends sitting down to compare costs of different colleges, how much you're willing and able to pay, and to teach them about how scholarships and financial aid work. And then there's giving. One of the greatest opportunities associated with teaching kids about money is teaching them how to give. Some parents suggest to their children that they designate a certain percentage of their money for giving whenever they earn it often 10%. Helping your child choose who to give this money to can be a really great opportunity to see what your kids value and to talk about specific needs that other people might have. Wendy Mogul, author of The Blessing of a Skinned Knee, also suggests that you involve your kids when you donate used items. Let them help you decide what to donate and research the different options of where to donate the items. Once you've taught children how to manage their own money, you can actually Involve them more than you might think with the family finances. When Delana's husband finished his medical residency, they felt an urgency to get out of debt and get their finances in line. Even though her four boys were young, they decided to involve them in the process. They talked about their goal of being debt-free, why this goal was important, and the sacrifices they would have to make in order to reach this goal. The kids actually got really into it. They, they understood why they had to miss out on some activities or why they would say no to treats at the grocery store. They even reminded them not to spend money at certain times. And then they celebrated each small victory as they went, as they paid off those loans. Lieber is a big advocate of talking to our kids openly about our finances in age-appropriate ways. Orman is also on this bandwagon, even encouraging parents to have kids help pay family bills and to sit down as a family each month to talk about how much they spend on utilities, their mortgage, etc. She also suggests that when you need to set up automatic bill pay online or set up accounts, that you let your ch kids control the mouse and guide them through the process so it's easy for them to eventually set up their own. My brother-in-law, John, likes to make the electricity bill a game. When it comes in the mail, he waves it around excitedly and asks the kids to guess what, the, what it cost this month. 
They open it up together and look at the month-to-month comparisons, and they talk about what they could do to make it lower. Then he asks questions like, would you rather spend money on leaving lights on or on ice cream? And if the bill is lower the next month, they go out to get a treat with the difference. Ultimately, as Richard and Linda Iyer emphasize in their book, The Entitlement Trap, the most important thing about teaching kids how to manage money isn't really about the money at all. They say, giving kids ownership of money is the precursor to giving them ownership of their things, of their savings, and of their ability to give. And this kind of material ownership can be the forerunner of giving kids ownership of their goals, their education, and their whole lives. Thank you for listening to the How She Moms podcast. I'd love to find out how you mom. There are four main ways to add your voice to this How She Moms community. First, you can email me at Whitney at HowSheMoms.com, or you can go to my contribute page at HowSheMoms.com and find out what topics I'm currently researching. There will be questionnaires that you can fill out there. You can also follow me on Instagram to see daily tips about how different moms approach the current topic. Finally, you can sign up to receive email questionnaires for each new topic so you can contribute your ideas. Special thanks to my mom for playing my theme music. She's been playing this song since I was a little girl, and to me, it's part of the soundtrack of motherhood.